Is my mic on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, I thought about what you, might, you guys might want to hear from somebody that's out in the industry um, based on some of my experiences. And so I want to kind of introduce you to a new field that I stumbled upon that I didn't really learn about at BYU. And as we all know, engineering just kind of prepares you to pr solve problems, but not necessarily for what you're actually going to be doing in the real world, right? So um, my background is, as, uh, um, as was stated, is a lot of sports. So I really enjoy sports. Um, my mom thought that I would be good at engineering, so that's the whole motivation for me, joining engineering. I used to be good at math and science, and um, so I jumped into engineering not really knowing what I was getting into. And then when I, was a, um, when I was a junior, I took an anatomy class, and I loved the cadaver lab. I loved when they opened up the bodies, and I loved seeing what was inside. And at that point, I thought, you know what, I probably want to be a doctor. But when I was um, on my recruiting trip as a freshman, the dean of engineering told me uh, that most women don't make it through the electrical engineering program, and certainly athletes don't. So I wasn't going to prove him right by um, quitting and, be, and going pre-med. So I finished out my degree, and then I, tr I tried to find a career where I could marry engineering with medicine. So when I went back and got my bachelor's degree, I mean my master's degree at, um, at UC Berkeley, I ended up uh, going into a biomechanics field there and found an advisor that did mechanical properties of bone and tissues, so ligaments, tendons, cartilage, that kind of thing. Did my research in hip implants, and after I graduated, I, um, I tried to find a job doing either sports equipment or medical devices, and that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about today. So biomedical engineering, it, it combines um, engineering and medicine in, in kind of diagnosis and monitoring of medical, medical conditions and therapy. And um, this is a relatively new field. It includes such things like uh, prostheses, sports equipment, clinical equipment, um, implants, imaging equipment, regenerative tissue growth, and drug research. So it's a pretty wide open field that can take all of these disciplines that you guys are learning and apply them. So my first company that I worked for was a company in San Diego called DJ Orthopedics. They do a lot of orthopedic bracing for athletes. So if you, um, if you look at the football players out there, they're, all the linemen are wearing knee braces so that they, if they get stuck in a pileup and somebody lands on them, that they don't tear some of the ligaments in their knee. Those are the products that I worked on. Um, the first product that I worked on when I was at DJ Ortho was an osteoarthritis brace. And osteoarthritis is when you have a degeneration of, sorry, I meant, you have degenera degeneration of the cartilage. So this is a healthy knee, you got some nice meniscus in here and your ligaments all look good. But either um, an autoimmune response or um, some sort of functional defect can cause this cartilage to wear away and then you get bone on bone, rubbing against bone. And your body, when you have bone rubbing against bone, it thinks the bone is broken and it tries to heal it. And so you get these really big knees with a lot of calcium deposits. And it's very, very, very painful. This is an x-ray that shows um, the lack of joint space here between the two. And that means that the cartilage is gone there. And this is sort of a cartoon representation of what that looks like and why that's painful. So this is a knee brace that, that attempts to um, kind of help with the condition, to, get, to keep the person active for as long as they can and avoid a, a total joint replacement as long as they can. And sort of the concept is that if you put a load here up, uh, up and above the knee, on this is the affected side here, so if you put a load up and above, up above and below, and then you put a, joint, a load at the joint here, you can kind of put a bending force on the leg that will shift the resultant forces that are going through your, your femur and your tibia right through here and make it so that there's just not quite as much load going where the defect is and it, it really kind of offloads the joint and gives you a lot of pain relief. And they're very, very effective. In fact, one of the most satisfying moments of my career is running into one of my products in the wild and just going up to the woman and saying, hey, what are you wearing on your leg? Oh, and she said, oh, it's a knee brace. I go, who makes that? And she had no idea. But, um, <laughs> but I said, do you like it? And she said, it's totally improved the quality of my life. I couldn't live without it. Before I wasn't able to get out and walk or run or ride my bike or anything. And uh, this has made it so that I can get back out there. Very satisfying feeling. So this is kind of what a brace looks like here. 
Um, they've got some uh, mechanisms here and here that kind of angle that brace towards the knee. But that wasn't what my first project was. My first project was um, to load the knee without the hinges binding. So on this side, you know, you have these mechanisms here and there's some joints here so that you can load in kind of the medial lateral direction without binding up the hinges. But on the other side, the, the gears would sort of kind of angle with the respect to each other and they'd wear out and you get a lot of product return. So it was my job to figure out what to do with the other side. And what I ended up doing was creating, um, separating the gear from the actual sidebar that went in there and, and created some pieces that, that had a ramp on them that they could kind of articulate with so that that side was free to float and free to move away from the knee when you angled this one in. And you, so you weren't pinching the knee and you didn't get any, anything wearing out. So that's one of my patents. Not that impressive, but still solved the problem. All right. So uh, one of the biggest problems with these braces is that they just slip down the leg and nobody wants to wear them, right? So um, one of the things you want to do is to try to make the brace mimic as much what the knee motion looks like so that it doesn't want to move up and down. Um, this, is a t this is a graph of the flexion angle of the knee from heel strike to when you lift your leg up and then you heel strike again. So when you first strike here, your flexion angle of your leg is, your knee is pretty small and then you get a little bit of a bump and then during swing phase when you're picking it up and moving it, you get a pretty high, high, high knee angle. So there's that motion to consider, just the flexion in one plane this way. But what's interesting is, is that there's also a lot of rotation in your knee that you try to follow. And so when at, at heel strike, it, um, your load's sort of in the back. This is like looking down on the top of the calf bone, your tibia. So your loads start here and they start to slide forward. And as you get your weight over your leg, then the loads are sort of in the middle. And then as you start to um, take your foot off the ground, you get this external rotation on your knee and your, your leg actually, your knee actually rotates out. Um, during the swing phase, it starts to come back. And then as you plant, the loads are actually directed backward on your knee. So we did some studying of this knee joint and uh, tried to create a hinge that mimicked that joint. Um, but then what ended up happening was it was so expensive and it required so many components that they ended up scrapping the project because they just couldn't sell it. And that's one thing that you need to be prepared for out in the real world is sometimes you'll devote a year to a project and then the company just decides that it, you know, it doesn't meet all their requirements and they don't have the, they don't have the money to move forward. So don't get too attached. So um, the next project that I worked on, it, it seemed kind of like a foofy project. And I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm the new girl. You're giving her some kind of graphic art thing. And, you know, I was a little offended at first. But it turned out to be a really awesome project. And uh, what happened was is the company wanted to offer the braces in color. And we had four different styles of brace. They each have a thigh and a calf piece, and there was a left and a right. So that translated, if they wanted 15 colors or patterns, to 1,680 different individual little parts that they would have to stock on the shelf. And if you think about it, they'd have to stock you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 of each one um, to be able to provide that color at a moment's notice, which, which ends up being way cost prohibitive. So they said, come up with a way that we can put the color on the same day that they order it, and we only have to stock one color. So what we did um, was come up with uh, something using the process of sublimation. Now, if you guys remember from your chemistry class, sublimation is when you go from the solid phase to the gas phase without going through the liquid phase in between. And this process is used a lot in the mugs that you see at the mall and the t-shirts that you have that, um, you know, you, there's no decal, but it's, you use heat and pressure and the right kind of ink and the right kind of substrate to transfer into and the molecules open up, the ink transfers into these molecules and then it closes down over the ink or the pigment and then traps the image in exactly the way that you did. So you can transfer photos, you can transfer any kind of bitmap type graphic and you can also transfer color. So the challenging part of this project though on, on mugs you know, there, it's a set shape, so you can design a press that comes in and, and is the exact shape of what you're doing, or a t-shirt, it's just a flat piece. So the challenging part of using this process with braces is that all these braces are custom. They take measurements of the leg, and they make it so that they are, um, that they fit, like, each individual leg. 
So I had to come up with a process that I was able to use this same technology to transfer to a shape that was completely different. It's proprietary, I can't tell you that. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so my next, um, my next project was an implant. So this is a guy that is severely bow-legged. It's called Genu Verum. And um, this misalignment, as you could see from you know, the OA slide that I had before, will cause um, abnormal loading on the inside of the knee, right? Eventually that cartilage is gonna wear out and this guy's gonna have OA. So they do a pre um, surgeons do a process called a high tibial osteotomy. The tibia is, again, the bigger bone in your calf, right here. And what they'll do, I decided not to put any gory pictures in case any of you are a little faint of heart. So I did cartoons. And uh, what they do, um, oh, first of all, let me talk about um, osteogenesis. So I mentioned before that when you break a bone, you put the two, the two pieces together, the micromotion that's between the two bones will cause a response in your body to heal that bone. They, it says, oh, it's broken. I need to send osteoblasts there to create and lay down bone and create a new bone structure. So this high tibial osteotomy that the surgeons do to correct this genu valgum, verum, sorry, um, is based on this osteogenesis. There are external fixation devices that are out there. Um, this is called an X fixator, and this is used for when somebody gets their bone shattered in an accident or in a gunshot. And you don't have, it's really hard to regenerate or just cast a bone where you're missing the middle part. So in that case, they'll, they'll clean up sort of the middle part. So now you have this big gap where there's supposed to be bone, and they'll put those two pieces together. They take screws through the body on the outside and, and connect into the bone. And then um, on the external part, there are these little worm gears that they just turn a little bit every day or every three days. So there's the micro motion there. It wants to lay down bone. And then you just keep continually separating it, right? And that bone just sort of fills in as you go, right? So in the case of a high tibial osteotomy, um, the normal procedure was that they would um, they'd kind of make a cut here, kind of straighten out the bone by making this wedge, or then they'd take a graft from maybe your pelvis or something and stuff bone in there, or they have some uh, tissues out there that um, kind of replicate human bone, and they'll stuff that in there and hope that it regenerates. But what we wanted to do with our case is to, make, to, to use the osteogenesis in the same way that they use for these big bone fractures in a high tibial osteotomy and have the patient grow their own bone so they don't have to go through the pain of surgery of having a bone graft or um, the other tissues fail a lot. So it's a lot more successful. So what we did is we put, um, put a device there. We would close the bone, put a device there, and then, then just um, this was an internally mounted ratchet device. And um, so what we do is... Um, I got to build this like a torture kind of device that looked a lot like a piece of sporting equipment, you know, so it had the posts that you'd rest your leg on um, in, in the up, above and below the knee. And then I put uh, another post on a lead screw that would push the knee from the side and um, eventually it would just, and that would cause this little mechanism here to ratchet open on a daily basis. So they could go to their doctor's office and uh, the doctor's office would put them in my torture device and it would ratchet it on its own. Um, it was really cool. We got to go to cadaver labs and, and surgically install these and use the device to open up there. And it's got, it makes kind of cool sound like when you crack your back when you're yawning, you get that nice good pop when it opens up. Um, but that became a commercially available, a commercially available product that is on the market today. That was kind of fun. So the next thing that I did is I went to Children's Hospital where they have a motion analysis lab. They take uh, kids that have cerebral palsy and put markers on their joints. And, and I apologize if any of you know more about cerebral palsy than I do, but the layman's understanding of cerebral palsy is that they have um, the motor neurons in their brain, the part of their brain that, has, that sends the signals to the muscles is either underdeveloped or has been damaged during childbirth or something. So they're perfectly just as smart as we are, but they just, their muscles are told to fire at the wrong time from their brain. 
So a lot of times they'll have these strange gates that you see, like or their muscle will be told to be firing all the time. Like if a calf muscle is said, you know, if, if it says fire all the time, then you're going to be walking on your toes all the time, right? And eventually those loads that those muscles put on the bones change the bone. Your bone forms based on the muscle, uh, forms based on the loads that it sees. So if your muscle is continually firing, those bones end up starting to twist and do all kinds of crazy things. Well, these surgeons will analyze gait of these kids and figure out which muscles are firing at which times and if they're in the wrong order or if they're constantly on or they should be on. And then they'll do surgeries where they detach the muscles and they'll put them someplace else um, to try to get the normal kind of motion and gait. Um, over a period of you know, 50 years, there's been a lot of studies on what normal gait looks like. So these blue lines, is, this is the hip flexion angle in normal gait. And this is the knee flexion angle in normal gait, again, from, from heel strike through the stance phase and then the swing phase is the big loops that you see. And this is the um, ankle, the ankle motion right here. And it's kind of hard to see, but these yellow lines here are this kid here. You know, his hip looks pretty good, so all those muscles are working really well and the knee's working all right, but the, but the ankle is completely off. So he's doing something funky with his ankles. And, uh, um, so, we'll, uh, so I worked in this, in this research center where we would take these kids through, analyze their gait, and then make recommendations with the physical therapists to the surgeons. And then what they'd do is they'd uh, take those markers. So, so what this room is, is a, it's got infrared strobing cameras that reflect off these markers. So it can pick up the, the three-dimensional location of these markers in space. And then there's a force plate in the floor as well you get the kid to hit the force plate so you know what the ground reaction force looks like. And then they also use fine wire EMG to measure the electrical signal in the muscle as well. So a lot of good stuff going on. But this picture behind me is the connection of those markers in spaces so they can kind of create this little um, animated um, picture of the guy walking across the room. And anecdotally, a lot of you probably know this is what they use a lot for the Pixar movies. They'll put those dots all over everybody and they'll have you know, real humans out there doing fight scenes, and then they'll just connect all the dots, and then they have the motions that they want their characters, their characters to move. So some of the other stuff that I did were uh, uh, VO2 studies. While I was there, there's um, um, how much oxygen you consume and how well you process oxygen um, is a measure of your level of fitness, so we did some work with that. Um, we had a bunch of above-the-knee prosthesis um, people come in. So we, we analyzed different types of um, types of solutions for people that had above the knee um, amputa amputations. So they were running across trying to hit the force plate and we're trying to see which one kind of propelled them the same way that a human would be propelled. Um, I did some studies on how sensitive the equipment was to marker placement. And um, I got to work on another knee brace while I was there uh, for somebody that had polio. Um, when you have polio, a lot of times your muscles um, lose a lot of strength, so we wanted a knee brace that would, when they would go to heel strike, it would lock out, but then, and, and would, would lock out while they were putting load on their leg, but then when they wanted to pick their leg up, it would release. So, so that's some of the fun stuff that I worked on there. Um, we also did some sports analysis. A lot of you know that they limit the pitch count for little league, little league players. Well, we can compare their motion to professional athletes as well by putting these markers all over them. Um, and make really fine adjustments on both professional athletes and little kids by saying, hey, well, this is why you're at risk for having a Tommy John surgery or detaching this muscle here. Um, there's also, this is a golfer that we did. You can analyze, you can put markers on the golf swing, you can put markers all over them, and you can, you can really make fine tunements or, or really analyze why somebody's better than another. Really interesting stuff. This is an archer from the U.S. national team, and we put markers all over her to try to figure out what was different when she made a great shot and what was different when she, when she didn't make a great shot. So fun stuff. I went back to another bracing company um, called Bragg, also in San Diego. And the opportunity that I had there was to work on a post-op brace. And a lot of the medical products that you have are the same from, from company to company, so it's really hard to differentiate yourself from other companies. This brace that's behind me is a really difficult for the uh, for the OR nurses to use. You can imagine somebody's just had an ACL surgery, the guy is out on the table and the doctor says, take this 300 pound guy and put a knee brace on him. 
when they're out. So this, the process for this brace, you have to take the straps off, take them through, put through the rings, you take the bars off of the foam, you take the foam off, and then you take the foam and you lift up the patient's leg and you put the foam on, the, both the thigh and the calf, and then you have to get the bars and the straps underneath the foam, and then you gotta kind of position them so they're on, you know, you try to get them down the midline of the leg on both sides, and then you gotta thread the straps through, pull them across, and if you've messed up on the alignment, you gotta take the straps off, you gotta, you know, open it up, you gotta put the bars down again, and uh, just a real pain for the people in the operating room. So my charge was to make that a lot easier for them, and also make it easier for the patient when they had to take it off to take a shower to put it back on again. So my solution was is to get rid of the foam completely, um, just and it made it a lot cooler um, and a lot more hygienic. And uh, I added also these telescoping bars here so that it one size fits all, and made some uh, sort of kind of creative buckles that you would just you wouldn't have to like undo them every time and put them back on. You just kind of hook them over this little hook here, and. Um, what was really fun is that like you lift up on this buckle here and it would release the strap just enough so that you wouldn't have to try to squeeze your leg to get it off. Just lots of fun little innovations like that. Um, but really the, the groundbreaker was this little clip right here that has some hook and loop on the back that allowed you to, even if you put it on wrong, you just flip up those little clips and then you could reposition the brace down the sides of the leg and then just flip them down and you were, and you were good. And this, Project was supposed to sell 10,000 a year. It was kind of a me too product. We just needed to have that in our portfolio so that we could compete with the big boys. But this, pro this project, instead of 10,000 a year, it was selling 12,000 a month, which created a whole other group of problems that are fun to have. But when you buy tooling, thinking that you're only gonna um, have to make 10,000 parts a year and you're making 12,000 a month, then it creates all kinds of manufacturing problems. Good problem to have though. So um, the next project that I worked on that was uh, kind of shifted the paradigm from um, what the bracing was today is to, again, try to um, reduce the migration of the leg, but make it, there are a lot of studies that show that the better that the brace fits on the leg, the better it performs. Um, so the challenge was is to create a brace that didn't need to be adjusted with screws or knobs or the user didn't have to do anything but that it would somehow conform to the leg. Actually, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. This is something else. So, kind of the manufacturing process for, for a brace is um, you create a flat pattern that you think might fit, and then you, you get it cut out, and then you go to your um, sheet metal rollers, and you roll it out, and then you put it on your leg, and you see if it fitted, you see if the gears ended up in the right place, and then you go back to the drawing board, you say, okay, well, this gear kind of came a little bit forward, so I think I'm gonna adjust my flat pattern in this way. And then you cut it out again, and then you go form it again, but you don't know whether you formed it the same way the next time. So you have a new brace, and it's a little bit different, but you don't know whether the adjustment was because of the flat pattern that you did differently, or if it's because you, know, the, you rolled it differently. So it was a real problem, and, and, and once you got to your manufacturing equipment, that you'd spend $100,000 on to form it, you'd find out that your flat pattern was wrong and it was because you reformed it differently the next time and that's why you had the problem. So um, what we did to solve this problem and to increase or decrease the time to market was to try to do a lot of this digitally. One of the guys um, had a friend who uh, had access to an MRI and he, went, and he went and he got a 3D scan of his leg and was able to slice it up and get what the cross sections looked like, and he was able to put together a 3D leg model that was pretty accurate. Then we had a lot of measurements, 50,000 data points of you know, what a large leg looked like, what a medium leg looked like, small, extra small, we were able to make 3D models of all of those. And we used, um, we used uh, these models to draw directly on the leg what we wanted our, what we wanted our or sort of a general look of what we wanted our brace to look like. And then we were able to cut that out digitally and then use unwrapping software to take that and flatten it out. And then we had a good first start at what our flat pattern looked like. This was a completely new method that we used that reduced our iterations from five or six down to two on the first time. And then the next time we used it, we got it right the first time. And the fun part of this job when you're working on sports equipment is that you get to take your products and take them out into the field 
and we had a local junior college that we used for uh, our football races. They were happy to receive free product and, and, tr and try out our stuff. So we felt like we were mutually beneficial with that way. All right, so this is the one that I was talking about where um, a better brace perform, a better fitting brace performs better. So what, what I decided to do on this one was to make the medial side or the inside of the leg flexible. A lot of the sports injuries happen when um, you get a lateral blow, a blow from the lateral side, someone's coming at you this way, or if you're watching football highlights a lot, even just a turn like this can create stresses on your ligaments that will, that will tear your MCL and your ACL. So um, in a brace, all you have to do really is guard against those kinds of motions. So the, the, the inside of the brace doesn't really need to be rigid. And that was the shift in thinking that helped us create this product. You can see from this graphic that a lateral blow, right, creates tension on the medial side, but it doesn't require it to be, be stiff. And actually, if it's a little bit more flexible, it can actually pull in toward the knee and conform to the leg a little bit better and protect the knee. Now, I know that um, I used to work at DJ Ortho, and they were using, um, BYU football team was using the, B, the DJ Ortho braces. But then when I came up with this one, um, our sales guys got in and they all shifted to this brace. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, so for those of you who are squeamish, don't look at the guy with the striped shirt and don't look at his left leg. Um, this, is, this is kind of the injury that we are trying to guard against. And there's just really nothing that you can do other than try to put something on the outside to do this. But there are all kinds of loads in there that we don't really understand. And you can't really do any testing on it because that's unethical, right? You can't just put a football player in there and say, hey, I'm going to run a 400 person into your knee and we'll see if my brace works. So a lot of the work that we did um, was in trying to instrument that. So we created these legs that uh, had you know, cables that represented the ACLs and the MCLs. And they, we had cables for all the muscles as well. We tried to get the tissue to be right. We'd put our braces on there and we'd you know, create these pendulums that would come and knock braces out. And, but none of it was really that, that good. But with the increase in um, computational power that we have these days and the, and the better programs that we have has really helped us to um, kind of think about the next generation of bracing and what we can do to guard against those loads. So you create a model of the leg, right? Um, and, and if you can accurately predict what, what loads it's going to see, and you put those in a finite element model and load the leg like it is, there is uh, something called um, topology optimization that can help you figure out wh where the material needs to be on the brace to guard against those loads. So um, I think uh, the program that we used was called Hyperworks. And what it does is, you know, if this is a beam here and you put it simply supported and you have a load on that beam and you ask it, what structure do I need? To, what's the minimum structure that I need to support the loads that I'm putting on there? You get something that you guys are familiar seeing, right? Well, if you keep saying, well, what if it was even more minimal structure? And you keep going and keep going, you get a pretty interesting structure of what that looks like, and you get to use minimal materials and um, make your structure as light as possible while still retaining all, the retaining all the strength that you need. Well, we use that on uh, the knee braces as well to figure out what a knee brace needs to look like to withstand the loads that you see in that picture. And it was very different. It's still in, it's still in development, so I don't have any pictures of what that brace ends up looking like. Um, but that's a fun way to use some of the technology to make products better. Now, currently, I'm working for a product development firm. Um, this is a really fun job for me because uh, companies come to us and say, we have this chemistry. We know that if we mix this with this and we um, have a bacteria that we introduce, that it will fluoresce or that we can tell a patient whether you know, they have uh, C. diff bacteria or the flu or things like that. Um, but we need a way to do it in the doctor's office. We don't want to have the doctor take a sample and send it to the lab because it takes too long and then they have to call them back and it creates a lot of problems. So, or, you know, you have to wait and you delay treatment. So companies come to us and they say, okay, we want to be able to take a sample and be able to dispense it into a disposable cartridge and do it all in the doctor's office. So one of the first projects I worked on was collecting 30 microliters of diarrhea. Well, that was interesting, right? Uh, it's sort of a mix of applesauce and milk and um, 
raisins and then taking a trip across the border to Mexico, right? To get your diarrhea samples. But uh, uh, that was interesting. And, and then the next step was to come up with creative ways of taking that sample, mixing it with solutions, and then dispensing it. And these are just some of the concepts that I came up with and presented to the customer. And they picked one and we moved on from there. Um, the second part of that is the cartridge that you actually put it into. So we dispense, we dispense the sample that's been mixed with reagents into the sample well and then use um, air ports to move the fluid through the cartridge. So we'll put it in, um, actuate these valves, and then you can move fluid from the sample well into a heating reservoir where they have a protocol, you heat it up to 90 degrees and it's mixing with some reagents in here and then we wanna move it over into another chamber where we have to heat it to 70 degrees and mix it with some other reagents. And well, maybe it doesn't mix well enough so we have to be able to move it back and forth and then at the end of it, push it into this valve which then distributes it into 16 little wells that we then um, feed fiber optics to and re we read the result based on that. And then this can be done in a doctor's office. And this one particularly is for what I mentioned before, which is C. diff. It's a bacteria that makes it so that you uh, have diarrhea all the time. And um, you just can't get rid of it. So the sooner they diagnose this, the better. And interesting story, though, the way to get rid of that is to, to get a poo transplant from somebody that's healthy and put it into you. So. <laughs> Another thing that I worked on was a safety scalpel. Um, there's a lot of push for, uh, for companies or for hospitals to prevent the doctors from sticking the nurses when they're handing equipment back and forth. So in this project, um, I presented a bunch of different button styles, a bunch of different spring mechanisms, um, and ways to, ways to do the safety scalpel. And then last Friday, we actually took all of these to a surgery center and uh, bought the surgeons lunch. And as they came in and out for lunch, we got to um, get their feedback on them as they came through. And you got to be prepared not to have your feelings hurt, for sure. So medical devices is a lot of fun because you're, you're making products that help people. You get to go out. You get to, you get to work with surgeons. You get to work with people and see how they work. But it's not all fun and games. It's a lot of paperwork because you have to prove to the FDA that you're not going to hurt people. And um, I won't go over them, but these are just some of the things that you, that you have to do to prove that you've met the design requirements and you've done all the testing and you've gone out and tested them with people and all of the components are exactly as you designed them and that your manufacturing process is repeatable and that you've done all the design reviews and everybody signed off on everything. A lot of engineering is that. And then I thought if I were uh, you guys, I would want just a few bits of advice from somebody who's been in industry on um, things that I wish that I would have known uh, when I was in your shoes. And the first one is when you're in an interview, it doesn't you don't necessarily have to have all the skills because you have your degree and then they know you know how to problem solve. So do your research on the company. Um, know what they do. There's nothing worse than having somebody ask, do you have any questions for me in the interview? And the, per the candidate says, what do you guys do here? Not impressive, right? Um, and be professional in that interview. Some of the techniques that I've used is to kind of try to get people to let their guard down so I can see kind of what they're really like. Um, one of the guys that came in to interview at DJ Ortho was one of the curve busters that you hate to have in your class, the guy that always gets 100% when everybody else is getting 70s, 60s. He was the smartest guy definitely at UCSD. He came in and um, the director of engineering asked him, what really bugs you? What do you really hate? And, you know, expecting something like, you know, when you don't get team members that pull your weight and then you have to, you know, go in and do their job for them and stuff like that, something on the work realm. And he said, when my mom makes me clean my room. <laughs> and he didn't get the job because of that answer. And rumor is, is that he went to the, to the neighboring company that also did orthopedic bracing and he was a complete nightmare there because all he wanted to do was sit at his computer and do his calculations and he didn't want to get out there and do the work. He wanted to tell other people what to do because he thought he was that special. So that just showed a level of insecure, or like immaturity that my boss was able to pick up on. Um, again, uh, when I was interviewing people, I liked to see people that like to work on stuff. So uh, I, liked, I liked mechanics. I liked people that built their own stuff that did renovations in their home. That meant that they liked 
getting in there and they liked building. <laughs> this is a technical engineering job. Um, that's always good because they like to see people that can actually transfer their work into action. Um, one thing that I didn't do while I was in school was to go out there and see what's out there. I knew kind of what I wanted to do, but I didn't know until I got into the workforce what I really wanted to do. So your, your professors, they know lots of people. If you think you're interested in a field, ask them for a contact. Ask them, do you know anybody that I can go shadow? Can I go see a manufacturing floor? Go see what they do so that you know if that's what you really have a passion for and you'll be surprised that you're like, uh, you know, that's not what I thought. I don't really want to do that and that'll help you tailor what classes that you take. Um, one other thing is, you know, you're a lofty engineer, you have this great degree, maybe you have a master's, you have a PhD, but the people that know the most are the ones that are putting your products together. They're the people that use them all the time. So don't have an ego that says that I know more than you because I have more schooling than you or I have more experience than you. These guys that use it all the time, they'll be able to tell you how to better design your product. And uh, I happened to be with uh, a guy on the plane on the way in. His son was a mechanical engineer at BYU. And he took a materials class his junior year and he just said, I do not like materials. I don't want to do this. He quit and he joined law enforcement. And my message to you is, I didn't like materials either. It's not what you're going to do. If that's not what you like, it's good information. I use that stuff when I'm picking what to make my injection molded parts out of, but it's not going to be your life. It's teaching you how to think. It's, it's teaching you a general knowledge of what you need to know um, when you move forward. So don't get discouraged. If you find a class that you don't like, just pick something else the next time and go out there and look for what you want. Thanks for having me here. I hope I had some, I said something that helps. And if you have any questions, um, these guys have my number. I'd love to talk to you if you're more interested in this field. Thanks.